I'm Carolyn Freund, Dean of the School of Global Policy and Strategy, and welcome to tonight's event, which will provide an insider account of the enormous Greek debt restructuring that took place in 2012. And before we begin, I'm just going to give a little bit background on what that is, because I think some of you were probably teenagers or tweens when, when that happened. Um, Hemingway famously wrote that you go bankrupt gradually and then suddenly. And um, this quote was adapted by the well-known macroeconomist Rudy Dornbush to financial crises, that, that they happen gradually and then suddenly. And just to put this in perspective for Greece, that happened three times from 2010 to 2015. And for our students here today, one thing they're learning is the importance of accurate data and especially accurate data in policy making. Well, faulty data is part of how this crisis began. So there are two criteria for countries to join the Eurozone, to adopt the Euro. One is a debt GDP ratio of 60% or lower, and the other is a 3% fiscal deficit. Um, and Greece basically uh, cheated on these criteria and had a fiscal deficit well above the 3% ratio when it joined. Why do countries want to join the euro? They want to join the euro in Europe, partly because it's a political project, but also because it eases trade across borders, encourages tourism, and especially allows you to borrow at probably lower interest rates than you would get otherwise. But and this is the important but, it means you give up your monetary policy. So you can't depreciate the currency in the event of a crisis. Um, so in 2001, Greece joined the Eurozone, cheating on it, faking its data on the deficit. Three years later, it hosted the Summer Olympics and racked up a ton more debt. It continued so that by 2009, its uh, deficit was 15% of GDP, and its debt to GDP ratio was 127%. The first bailout was in 2010. In 2012, there was a new bailout, and that's the one that Charles Delara is going to talk about today. But this was a huge tragedy because it involved a severe humanitarian crisis. GDP per capita fell almost in half. So people's living standards halved. Um, unemployment hit 27.5%. Youth unemployment was 58%. And it was extremely persistent going back to being in the euro because Greece couldn't see its own currency depreciate and then grow through exports. So it lasted a long time. Only this year is Greece expected to regain its pre-crisis income level. Um, and this history is really important because it's probably not over, and I'm really curious what Charles Delara is going to say about that, because we see countries in the Eurozone not sticking to those criteria I mentioned earlier and much bigger countries than Greece. So just as an example, Italy's uh, fiscal deficit 7.4% of GDP, and it has debt of 140%. So now I'm going to turn to introducing our speaker, who was really on the front lines of the 2012 restructuring. Charles Delara has spent much of his career dealing with sovereign debt and global financial issues. He was managing director of the Institute for International Finance, or the IIF as we call it in Washington, from 1993 to 2013. And IIF is the most important trade group for the global financial services industry. It involves banks, insurance, hedge funds, et cetera. And in 2011 and 2012, he led private creditors 
in negotiating the restructuring of Greek debt. And I really can't emphasize enough how important this group was in resolving the crisis that the IMF and the ECB couldn't seem to handle. It was collective action by the private sector actors, their technical expertise, and working together through the IIF that allowed um, this seemingly unsustainable debt to, to, to finally be resolved. So, and before going to the IIF, Charles had a long career at JP Morgan where he was a managing director before uh, leading the IIF. He also held senior positions in the US Treasury Department in the George H.W. Bush and Ronald Reagan administrations. He's on a number of boards, and most importantly, he's on the board of the School of Global Policy and Strategy on our advisory board. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Charles Delara. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Caroline. It's a real pleasure to be back with my wife in San Diego. Uh, our youngest son spent four years in San Diego as a student, and we got to know the community reasonably well. Uh, we haven't been in recent years, but we've been closely affiliated with uh, GPS and UCSD now for six or seven years. Pijin, my wife, is on the board of the 21st Century China Center, and I've had the pleasure, as Caroline mentioned, of serving on the board of the International Advisory Board of the university, which plays a critical role in helping provide an overall framework of guidance uh, for the activities of GSP. Um, where is its chairman? There he is, Rafael Pastor is significant reason why I'm here today because he's provided tremendous leadership for the advisory board and galvanized support for the uh, growing contributions and stature of the faculty and the student body here. Um, I'd also like, before I move into the substance of my remarks, to recognize a few other dear friends with us here today. Uh, to my left is a, a former co-conspirator of my many years at the Treasury Department, Jack Sweeney, and uh, to his right, uh, his wife, Deborah Reiner. Uh, and Jack and I worked together on many sovereign debt issues, uh, as you'll hear a bit during my remarks today, especially on Latin debt issues. And, uh, and there's another young fella in the room. He used to be young anyway. John Cottingham. Where's John? Um, John? There he is. Uh, John is a dear friend of mine from my roots in South Carolina. And I wanted to recognize him today, partly because he's another longtime resident of San Diego, uh, convinced of the beauties and charm here, but partly because his brother, uh, Michael Greer, was my first mentor. And I speak to the students in the room today. If you haven't had the pleasure and the honor of finding a mentor, male or female, short or tall, uh, look out for one. And, and when you find that person, reach out to them and build the relationship. Mike was the first person who ever convinced me that I could actually look beyond the parochial borders of South Carolina. Now, that may not mean too much to you here in Southern California, where we have this beautiful, expansive state. But for a kid growing up in South Carolina, it meant a lot. And I pay tribute to Mike in his memory today, who's sadly no longer with us. Um, you know, when you think of uh, GPS, you think of a school that has established its reputation and built that reputation under Caroline's leadership, focused on Asia Pacific issues, right? South of the border, you have a tremendously influential center dealing with Mexico. Um, and over the years, uh, this has really become a center of, of excellence and research and dialogue in issues relating to China. Uh, and more recently, it's developing quite a, a forte in dealing with issues relating to India. But I take encouragement by the title of this school, which is Global Policy and Strategy. And so here we are today, not to talk about any of those particular issues directly, but to talk about a project and a problem that arose, a severe problem that arose in Europe. As Caroline said, just a little over a decade ago, 
which actually threatened the entire fabric of European economic and financial integration. And hopefully by the time I finish my remarks, you'll have a little sense as to why this kind of experience does have some relevant lessons for this part of the world and for the global debate, which GPS is becoming increasingly capable of framing and participating in. Um, you know, when most of us think of Greece, I'd like to share three different bits of context for this experience I lived through. First, when most of us think of Greece, we either think of the beautiful beaches, which I suspect some of you have enjoyed. I know there's at least one gentleman in the room who's actually from Greece, but I suspect many of you have had the pleasure of visiting Greece over the years. Or we think of classical Greece, the country that for 100 years, and that was a bit all, dominated the global landscape and left behind for us our first framework of democracy, the first legitimate historians of the world, particularly Herodotus, the first credited playwrights, gentlemen like Aeschylus and Euripides, the first credible and long-lasting philosophers like Aristotle and Plato. Many of us still admire and hold in wonderment what Greece accomplished in those years. But the contrast I was faced with in the spring of 2010 was stunning because as Carolyn suggested, it was nothing like classical Greece. It was a country uh, beset with massive economic and financial problems. Many of these were deep-seated structural, behavioral, cultural, and political problems. After 450 years of tutelage under the rather heavy thumb of the Ottoman Empire, most Greeks had become allergic to the very notion of paying taxes. And their view of government was, well, look, it's a, it's a balanced relationship. We don't pay our taxes, and you hire six of my cousins. Doesn't that work? What's wrong with you, government? Can't you, can you deal with that equation? Well, the reality is that's what the political system largely produced over the 50 to 60 years preceding the crisis of 2010 and 11 with one clientelistic, patronage-oriented government after another, unfortunately sitting atop an increasingly inefficient public sector, bloated and full of political appointees who had oftentimes no business in their jobs. But perhaps even more disturbingly, uh, implementing a series of licensing and regulatory and government policies which suffocated private investment and suffocated and eradicated the potential to build productivity in the economy. Now, Greece wasn't totally bereft of some strong segments in its economy. It had a tourist sector, which was strong. It had an um, agro-business sector, which has developed very impressively over the last years. And it had a shipping sector, which was a global leader, but paid virtually no taxes, consistent with the overall pattern of how Greek corporations and, and citizens behaved. Um, in the spring of, in the fall of 2009, uh, a new government was elected there. Uh, George Papandreou, whose father was a prime minister and whose grandfather remains one of the icons of post-war Greece. George was not prepared for the storm that was about to hit him because as Caroline said, and as Jack had mentioned to me over lunch earlier today, when markets lose confidence in a country or a corporation, they can do so with a vengeance and a speed that disorients anybody. And that's what happened. This new government was elected and announced that, well, we've got a 5.5% fiscal deficit, and um, we're going to deal with it. Uh, we'll get it under control. And the markets kind of furrowed their brow but didn't react too much. A few weeks later, as the new finance team was digging into the numbers, they discovered, well, that fiscal deficit looks more like 8%, and they announced this to the world. 
a little bit more concern on the part of the markets, but still the rating agencies did nothing. Asleep at the switches, they often were in those days, and still are, I'm afraid to say. Uh, a few weeks later, however, one more announcement came. Well, our fiscal deficit last year actually looks closer to 11%. Now, you have to admire the team that inherited this situation in a way because they were revealing the numbers as they discovered them. One of the poor gentlemen who was in the middle of that is actually still under persecution by European and Greek courts for his role in revealing that data, which is a very unfortunate turn of events, which should be resolved soon, I hope. But the final blow came a few weeks later when it was announced that Greece's fiscal deficit in 2009 was actually closer to 15%. At that point, the markets threw their hands up and said, we're out of here. And for a country that had depended steadily upon market access during the preceding decade, Steady inflows of capital, investors, investment banks, pension funds, banks, and insurance firms all chasing yield, as creditors are prone to do, believing erroneously that I can take a risk by investing in Greece. It gives me good returns, 300 basis points over German bonds. And look, I'm sure that Germany will be there to protect them when they get into trouble. Well, obviously, this turned out to be an extraordinarily bad bet by the creditors. A crisis ensued because suddenly Greece was without any capacity to finance its large fiscal and current account deficits. It only had its domestic banks, which were trapped in the system and had no choice but to continue to provide domestic financing. And it had to increasingly rely upon the IMF and the European community who stepped in to a certain degree. Um, initially, there was hope that this crisis could be resolved without a debt restructuring. Many of us in the private sector and many in the public sector were increasingly skeptical about that possibility. But I also understood why Europe had an allergy to restructuring of debt, because the central bank president at the time, Jean-Claude Trichet, considered the debt of any country in the Eurozone sacrosanct. And I think if it's important for me to take just another little detour in history here to the creation of the Euro. In 1951, the European steel and coal community was created. This was the first concrete step to integrating the European economy after World War II. It may not, in hindsight, seem like a great event, but Europe tried steadily over the next decades to build upon that and increasingly integrate trade and financial flows, and they made some meaningful success. In the late 70s, impetus grew to consider the prize jewel, a common currency, why should we be beholden to the dollar? The dollar goes up, the dollar goes down, we're hostage to American policies. And I remember a meeting I attended in the late 70s as a young Treasury officer with G5 officials, the deputy finance ministers of the top five economies in the world, where the US official was berated by French and German and other officials for the profligacy of the US. We had a growing fiscal and current account deficit. Not many of you are old enough to remember these days, but some of you are, and others will have read about it. But the US was in a moment of some demise. And there was a lack of confidence in our economic future. And the Europeans were, as we were at the Treasury, increasingly concerned about this. It was such an ignominious moment that we actually had to go off market and borrow German, German marks and Swiss francs in order to bolster our foreign exchange reserves to support the value of the dollar. In any case, the consequence of that was a galvanized effort in Europe to move toward a common currency. We're not going to let ourselves be beholden. We're going to create our own currency. We're going to compete with the dollar. Not necessarily a bad idea at all, although they forgot along the way some of the critical ingredients as, of a successful common currency. In any case, that process went forward, and in the late 1990s, early 2000, 
the euro was created. It was the jewel in the crown of European economic integration. But it was built upon certain assumptions and presumptions which did not necessarily hold to be true. One of which was that the, the debt of every country whose currency was blended into the euro is sacrosanct, and there will be no restructuring of that debt because it would fracture the integrity, the honor of everyone in the eurozone. Well, this notion made it very difficult to contemplate a restructuring of Greece's debt, which in early 2011 was massive, simply massive. Some of us in the private sector were increasingly concerned that there was a huge storm ahead of us. One of my dear bosses at the Treasury Department, Secretary of the Treasury, Nicholas F. Brady, had a phrase he would often express when he saw a big, big global problem. He would say, Delara, I see a train wreck coming. I don't know when it's going to happen or where it's going to happen, but I see a train wreck coming. And I think that captured the sentiment of many of us who were looking at the Greek situation in early 2011. Europe was reluctant to move toward a restructuring, but the markets were increasingly pointing toward a restructuring. So what was to be done? I called up European leaders and pleaded on behalf of the private creditors, let's start a process of negotiating a restructuring of Greek debt. It's the first time in modern history that I'm aware of, perhaps Jack or Caroline know of other cases, where the creditors were actually the ones knocking at the door of the debtor, seeking to reschedule the debt. This is not the way it generally happens. In Latin America in the 1980s, it was always the Mexicans or the Brazilians or the Argentinians or the Venezuelans or you name the country showing up at the doorstep of the Treasury or the IMF saying, hey, guys, we're out of money. We need to restructure our debt, otherwise we're going to default. In this case, we in the private sector became so increasingly concerned that we actually initiated restructuring talks. Europe didn't quite know what to do with it. Why did we do it, we're asked. And even today, I get that question oftentimes. Why would creditors want to initiate a restructure which you know will result in a loss of the value of your claims? The answer was pretty, pretty profound. It was twofold. One is, for every dollar that Greece owed these banks, these investment banks, these insurance companies and pension funds, Italy owed $4. So if Greece cracked, and was forced out of the Eurozone, the concern was growing by the day that Italy would be right behind it. And the banks of Europe, which represented the bulk of the creditors, could sustain a loss of their exposure or their, or their claims on, on Greece. They couldn't sustain. They would have been, their capital base would have been wiped out if they'd lost the value of their claims on the Italian government. There was a bigger reason as Caroline pointed out, the inclusion of Greece in the Eurozone was never just an economic project. It was part of a political project. And I think it's important to understand the dynamic interaction between politics and economics and finance in cases like this. Uh, after World War II, uh, war ceased in most countries around the world. There were two exceptions. A civil war continued ablaze in China, we know how that ended up a few years later, and a civil war continued ablaze in Greece. It took until 1949 for the nationalists, with the support first of the Brits and then the Americans, to subdue the communist forces that were insurgent in the country at the time. And as the Cold War took shape after World War II, it was clear that Greece provided the bulwark in that part of the world geographically, militarily, strategically, against a further erosion of democracy in that part of the world. No one in 2011 and 12 who really thought about the problem wanted to lose Greece, not just as a member of the Eurozone, but as a member of the European community. And I think it's important to see the nexus of all of this. Eventually, after a long year of intense negotiations, during which we went through some bizarre circumstances, one of which was when I first asked, when I was told by Jean-Claude Juncker, who was the 
chief finance minister of the European Union at the time. I said, Jean-Claude, we'd like to initiate restructuring talks. He said, Charles, we reluctant, but we authorize you to do that. I said, with whom should I negotiate, the Greek finance minister? He said, no, you negotiate with the Italian deputy finance minister. So I started scratching my head. What logic is this? Is this the way the Eurozone operates? My Lord, let me go back to Latin America. I know at least a straightforward opportunity there. I knew I could deal with the Mexican finance minister or the Argentinian. Well, dealing with Argentinians is not so straightforward. But anyway, um, the, the reality is that they had a deputies group of finance ministers, and it happened to be an Italian deputy who chaired the group. And they thought, well, we can't let the Greeks speak for themselves. So we're going to put this group in charge of the negotiations, but we'll have the IMF, the World Bank, not the World Bank, but the IMF, the European Commission, and the ECB alongside. So you'll have some other parties to negotiate with. Um, when I first came to meet with the Italian deputy finance minister, he said, Charles, can we have a private meeting ahead of time? And I said, sure. Very capable, distinguished economist named Vittorio Grilli. He said, Charles, I don't want to be here. What do you mean, Vittorio? He said, don't you realize I've got no interest in representing Greece? I've got an economy that is burning. I've got a finance minister and a president who can't stand the sight of one another. The markets are intensely pressuring our, our debt as they are Greece's. And you expect me to spend all of my time looking after Greek debt? Uh, I said, well, you know, you better talk to your bosses in Brussels because you're the one I was told to negotiate with. And that issue was not resolved for three months. We kept sitting around the table and having these talks. And it's true that Berlusconi, who was running the show in, in, uh, in Italy at the time, who was every bit as erratic as some latter-day politicians that we might know, um, he, was, uh, he was difficult. And, and I would not have wanted to be in Grilly's shoes by any means. But the fact of the matter is we had a, a market sensitive crisis on our hands with Greece, and no one on the other side of the table was taking responsibility for it. We had to go all the way, personally and directly, to Chancellor Merkel and to President Sarkozy of France to find someone who had authority for us to negotiate with. That didn't provide immediate solutions, but it did provide a path forward. And eventually, with the benefit of a new prime minister, the government fell in Greece in the middle of these negotiations for reasons which I won't go into in great detail here. Uh, but the Lord was looking down upon us somehow because the technocratic government that came into office in Greece in the fall of 2011 was led by a mild-mannered Harvard professor, former deputy president of the European Central Bank, who had not won, not even in his pinky, political bone in his body, not an iota, politics about this man, but capable, smart, sincere, patriotic, not nationalistic, but patriotic, and he had a sense of what needed to be done, and thank goodness uh, the leaders of Europe and the leaders of Greece decided to appoint him prime minister, and if there is one hero in my version of this story, it's Lucas Papademos for the leadership he provided during that six-month window when I was able to negotiate thank God, finally, directly with someone responsible, and he was the person. It eventually took renewed involvement by Merkel and Sarkozy and other key players in Europe, but the problem was resolved, and the eventual outcome on the spot in 2012 was the elimination of $108 billion of debt. Now, I realize when you see the debt numbers for the U.S. economy thrown around these days in the trillions, $108 billion may not look that large, but it remains the largest elimination of debt on any single day in history. We took another $100 billion of Greek debt, and we stretched it out over 30 years at highly subsidized rates. With this example, the European community feeling a bit, a bit niggardly at the moment, not really having expressed any willingness to restructure any of its debt, decided it would also concede to some concessional rates. And the result was that it dramatically changed the debt profile for Greece over the next decade, the benefits of which are now becoming increasingly evident.
the banks had to write off, and we do all these things by net present value terms, the banks had to write off eventually 73% of their claims, well over $150 billion of claims. The consequence was severe for these creditors who should have known better, who should have had serious risk management policies that didn't follow them at all. The consequence for Greece, however, as Caroline pointed out, was much more dramatic. Unemployment skyrocketed to 27%. Suicides tripled. Poverty more than doubled. Outbound immigration, almost a million citizens of 11 million people country left Greece, depriving it of vast human resources which it needed then to rebuild the economy. Mistakes were made along the way. And one of the reasons why I wrote this book, and not just by the private creditors, although we made our share of them, particularly leading up to the crisis, Mistakes by the IMF, mistakes by the European Commission, mistakes by the ECB, mistakes by the Greeks. And only now, as Caroline pointed out, is the Greek economy recovering a real sense of momentum. I was, in fact, very pleased to wake up one cold morning this past December to see that The Economist magazine has designated Greece country of the year. Now, I took a certain satisfaction in that, and I immediately picked up the phone and called the current prime minister and congratulated him, But I also, who's, a, who's an extremely capable leader. But I also called Lucas Papademos, who's now working in the scientific field and has gone back into his largely private life, to congratulate him because he planted many of the seeds that led to this recovery of the Greek economy. But this country is far from out of the woods. When you see countries... And I think there are many economists in the room, and they can attest to this. When you see countries with deep structural inefficiencies, particularly as part of a common currency where you don't have independent monetary policy and you don't have independent exchange rate, you've got to really read deeply into the structure of your economy to create a competitive, productive economy in today's competitive world. And that is what Greece needs to do now. They've already made initial steps toward it. But it's a long road to hoe. I just gave a, two different presentations in Greece on the book I wrote, and there was some questioning. You know, Mr. Delara, you know, you seem quite positive about the whole experience of restructuring the Greek debt, and Greece is back on its feet. The rating agencies have blessed Greece, and it's now back in investment grade rating. Why are you still so cautious? I said, because this is a generational challenge. And I would maybe even hazard as a multi-generational challenge because they have developed such bad habits in certain aspects of the Greek economy. There's such a weakness in the professionalism of the public service. There's such a, an affinity for excess regulation and excess licensing requirements that it just takes years to pull out the weeds. Um, and so I think Greece needs to stay on this course for some time. Whether the IMF and, and Europe will learn some of the lessons still remains to be seen. When the euro was first envisaged some decades ago, Helmut Kohl and many other leaders in Europe thought there would be a common currency and a common fiscal policy, an integrated fiscal policy that could back up the strength of the common currency. It never happened. And frankly, if you see the spread of populism, nationalism in Europe today, there's virtually no movement toward a common fiscal policy. They talk about a common banking union. But still today, if an Italian bank failed, the German taxpayer would not be on the hook for one dollar to help pick up the cost of that. Now, you can say that's just fair. Why should German taxpayers pay for the failures of an Italian bank. The problem with that is, is either they want to share in the glory and share in the burden, or they don't. And I think this is the challenge which Europe faces today. I certainly hope that it will be up to that challenge. But my final thought this afternoon is not just that, that Greece and Europe face this existential challenge on the preservation of their common currency.
but that no country is immune from sovereign debt problems. One never knows when or where it will hit. Markets can be so relaxed, so unconcerned about a country's sovereign debt for days, months, years, and then suddenly they wake up one day and say, ooh, we're not so comfortable. What's happening here? Let's go invest somewhere else. And they run like lemons in the sea. And the result of that can be devastating for the country involved. The reality is that no country is immune from sovereign debt pressures. If I look around the European Union today, it's easy to identify Italy and France as countries which are vulnerable, which are not doing anywhere near enough to manage their sovereign debt positions. But it's also easy to look here at home and ask ourselves, where in the world did fiscal discipline go in Washington? How in the world is it that we now have not one, but two dominant political parties who have lost any sense of priority for fiscal discipline? Ever since the huge expansion of our fiscal position in the aftermath of the global financial crisis of 2009 and eight and nine, which was temporarily justified under President Obama, no one, neither Obama nor Trump nor Biden has made any serious effort to rein in our fiscal deficit. Our debt now is larger than our GDP and is rising steadily. What will be the outcome of this is anyone's guess, but um, we're gonna need a correction at some point, let's just hope we don't wait for the markets to force it. Thank you very much for your time here this afternoon. Uh, is this better? I think it is. Uh, Italy's debt is pushing close to 150%. Now, there's a widespread perception that most of it is held by Italian households, and there's some truth to that. But the reality also is that Hedge funds and other market participants can make life really hell on wheels when they decide to, that they've lost confidence in or want to attack a country's fiscal position. And while the current Italian government has reined in fiscal spending marginally, there's very little dynamic growth in Europe to suggest that GDP can outgrow a steady rise in their debt. And uh, there's also very little to suggest that Europe and the IMF are any better prepared today than they were a decade ago to deal with the sovereign debt crisis. Europe created something called the European Financial Stability Fund. They change the name of this every few years, but it's, it's in a sense a pocket of funds which Europeans have collectively committed. It pales against the potential scale of an Italian or even more a French sovereign debt crisis. The IMF, on the other hand, likes to do its business country by country. There's something called IMF quotas. If you've never run across that, well, you're a blessed person because it's a highly technical set of issues. But it determines the scale of IMF lending. And part of the problem with Greece was that they were trapped into lending to Greece by Greece's IMF quota. It should have been based on the entire quota of the Eurozone, which is a revolutionary but somehow sensible concept. Uh, Europe remains, in my view, unprepared for another sovereign debt crisis. When it comes to the U.S., you're absolutely right. There are some major differences. We're not part of a common currency. We have seniorage. We have the world's dominant currency. Even today, with all of the so-called rise of the Chinese renminbi and, and the euro and the Japanese yen, it remains the dominant currency in global, global settlements. But that does not make us immune from a decision of a rating agency looking at the chaos in Washington. I mean, when's the last time we passed a coherent budget? No, we don't. We do these things by continuing resolution, which basically is a message to the markets and to the world. We really can't get our act together on this appropriations bill, so we just pass a continuing resolution, which is the, the term of our in order to, uh, to, to obtain an additional round of funding. And then every few months or every few years, it's now increasingly frequent, someone stands up and says, no more debt. We're tough on debt. Don't you understand? We're fiscal disciplinarians. And they're never terribly serious about it, but it produces a bit of 
you know, a song and dance among the politicians, and then the debt ceiling is, is increased. Uh, I, I don't think a crisis in U.S. fiscal debt is imminent, but having lived through as a young tre Treasury officer that moment in the late 70s, not part of a common currency, but facing hyperinflation, facing a growing lack of confidence in our currency, which was putting steady down with pressure, the dollar was in trouble, and it was perceived to be in trouble. And a crisis around the U.S. fiscal is probably going to take a different shape, and it's hard to know. My crystal ball, even in this clear sunshine of San Diego, just isn't strong enough to know what that crisis may look like. But it's hard for me to um, imagine that I would be surprised if in the next 10 years the rating agencies and or markets don't get fatigued with the steady rise of, uh, of the U.S. fiscal uh, deficit and, and debt. I just don't see the level of responsibility or leadership. How many occasions have we really seen this discussed as a serious issue in the political campaign this fall? Not many this, this spring and, and in summer leading into the fall. Uh, if I look to emerging markets, which is a very relevant question, um, one of my biggest concerns relates to Turkey, which I think has hyperinflation right now and has managed to somehow try to follow a totally nonsensical monetary policy for the bulk of the last decade. Uh, it thought it could get away with it, but it hasn't. Uh, many countries in low-income emerging markets are struggling with debt. Uh, and the reality is that countries make a profound mistake of thinking because they have temporary access to capital markets that they can add to whatever their concessional debt is in places like the World Bank to their market-based debt. And the reality is when they do that, the debt service obligations rise dramatically and then when they run into difficulties, they're not prepared at all to meet the problems. As I look south of here, uh, I see um, a tendency, again, for countries to run into serious debt problems, the most severe of which today is, is clearly Argentina, and whether or not they'll be able to, uh, to work their way out of the problem remains very much unresolved. Um, one final point, whether it's Europe, the U.S., or emerging markets, the framework for working out sovereign debt issues has never been crystallized. During my years at the IIF, we tried to provide a framework for this, and it, it made a difference during the Greek negotiations, the so-called principles which we developed, which are worth, worth looking up, provided a framework for working our way through. But the reality is that the debtors and the creditors have nothing comparable to Chapter 11 when it comes to the sovereign world. And so it's a particularly thorny, uncertain world which takes men and women of goodwill and skill to try to find common ground, and that is not easy in today's hyper world of geopolitical tensions. Excellent. Thank you. I'm going to open up to questions now. Yes, in the back. Charles, you talked about um, dealing with, trying to find who to deal with on the, in, with respect to Greece. Can you talk about your own clients, the private creditors? Uh, was it a, e easy to get them on the same page? Because typically you'll have traditional lenders who own the bonds at par, um, and then you'll have the hedge funds and the distressed credit players that own them at 30 cents. Who, it just seems like those interests don't often align. I'm just curious what the dynamic was like. Well, they don't often align, and, and I must say that, that looking back upon it, negotiating with my own clients, the, the creditors, was sometimes as difficult or almost as difficult as dealing with the European officials and, and the IMF. Why was that? Because, first of all, they were in, for a large period, they were in denial. We're going to get through this. We are not going to have a problem. Uh, secondly, because they all did come in at different stages. And, you know, you had hedge funds buying up the debt at various uh, secondary market prices. You had pension funds, which really had no business at all investing in Greek debt. You had insurance firms. Again, these were not just banks and investment banks. So you had quite a diverse array of private, private creditors. I had two advantages, though. One is I had a board of directors who at very senior levels, my board at the IIF was, were constant, 
constituted of the chairman and CEOs of most of these institutions. And so I was able to constantly work the problems at the working level, at the mid-CFO level, and at the CEO level. And my experience over the years at the Treasury probably helped me in good stead. And I also had a wonderful collaborator who at the time was a senior advisor to the chairman of BNP Paribas, which was Europe's largest, Europe's largest creditor. He's now the chairman of the bank. Extremely capable guy who had been president of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. He was a partner because as soon as the creditors would try to drive a wedge between me and Jean, we would get our hands together again and push back by going to their bosses. It was an endless process. When I say endless, up and down the line on the creditor side, up and down the line on the debtor side to find common ground. But that's what it takes in any of these debt negotiations. You know, when I think back to the experience that people like Jack Sweeney and I had in dealing with Mexico or Argentina in the 1980s or Brazil, you know, it's a constant continuing effort to find some common ground. And you do find that uh, rather than viewing your, your the, the debtor and the creditor as an enemy or as an adversary, which is a mistake that some of the Europe, Northern Europeans made during the Greek debt negotiations because they thought they had to be punitive. But you, know, you find yourself really uh, almost being a partner with the debtors because it's in everyone's interest to find a solution to this that avoids cracking up a system that had been in the process of being built for 60 years. There's a question up here. Yeah. Um, I have two questions, Charles. One, I'd, I'd like you to share with the audience um, the conditionality that's normally put on these countries and why it's so traumatic for them to have the adjustments that they have, why it, why it has such a big effect on the economy. And um, the second question relates to what Caroline was saying about the, uh, the dollar being, you know, this, this great currency and the effects. I mean, you mentioned Rudy Dornbusch and bankruptcy, right? You go slowly but surely. What happens if the bond, you know, bond managers and so forth one day decide that's it? We're not going to refinance the United States Treasury anymore. What, what are the implications of that? Well we better duck. Um, you know, I think uh, Jack's question had really two parts. His first one related to conditionality, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, but traditionally the IMF requires a certain amount of re-implementation of fiscal and monetary discipline because usually the source of a fiscal or balance of payments deficit that is perceived as unsustainable is either highly constrained and inefficient supply chains or excess demand. In addition, over the last, I would say, since the mid-1980s, the tendency has been for the IMF, with the strong support of the World Bank, to work on the structural sources of inefficiencies in these economies as well. In the case of Greece, two big mistakes were made. One is that the pressure was put almost entirely on fiscal adjustment at a pace which was unsustainable. And to this day, I'm disappointed and surprised that the IMF has not ever fully recognized the cost to the Greek citizenry at the mistakes that were made. They issued a highly technical report a few years later, supplemented by a brief comment of the managing director of the IMF at the time, Christine Lagarde, who now runs the European Central Bank, which was to say, oh, we underestimated the amount of the fiscal multiplier. What a pathetic technical explanation for destroying over a million jobs. Uh, and excuse my French language when I use the word pathetic, but. The fact of the matter is, is that by referring to the fiscal multiplier, she was alluding to the fact that they had underestimated the negative impact on the economy of further rounds of tax increases and fiscal adjustments. Pacing, it was absolutely essential for Greece to undergo a period of 
steady fiscal adjustment. Pacing the fiscal adjustment was entirely misread. And that's why adjustment needs to be managed very carefully. These multilateral institutions bear a tremendous responsibility to get things right. And the odds of getting things exactly right in a country like Greece, where these fiscal multiplier models were built around emerging market economies, and where you have 100% of your staff are PhD macroeconomists, not a political scientist or a cultural expert anywhere in sight, and you expect to get things right in Greece, it doesn't work that way. And so I'm a strong advocate for retooling the human resource base of these multilateral institutions, especially the IMF, to ensure that they have a combined set of expertise that covers the wide range of issues. You need to be, you need to be a part historian. You need to be a part cultural expert. Yes, do you need to be a macroeconomist? Absolutely. You need to be an expert on the different sectors of the economy. It's not beyond the capacity of the IMF to hire that kind of talent. The World Bank has much of it, but it's often been said that 19th Street is the widest street in the world because the divisions between the IMF and the World Bank in working together are, are deep-seated and historical, like many of the problems in the Greek economy. Um, Jack, I think the second part of your question re referred to uh, the potential for an abrupt market reaction. And while I can't rule it out because the U.S. capital markets, I can't rule it out because markets can react, as we know, in a very abrupt and somewhat spasmodic and even erratic fashion. Over the long run, markets are beautiful instruments of adjusting economies. In the short to medium run, they can be extremely abrupt and costly to the countries involved in it. Um, the, mitigant, the mitigating forces in this case are that the U.S., the federal treasury market is the largest and deep, deepest capital market in the world today of liquid bonds. And the holdings of it are not only widespread among the private investor base, but also among central banks around the world. Now, you would be, we would be in deep, deep trouble if the private markets decided to dump their holdings of U.S. Treasuries, and at the same time, central banks decided they were going to do the same things. That's a, uh, that's a recipe for a catastrophic outcome where interest rates would soar through the roof to such a level that they would make today's interest rates look low. Um, you know, it's hard to forecast or uh, speculate beyond that, but I do think you know, I, I went to see the, the chief economist of one of the top uh, investment banks in, in New York recently, and she said to me, you know, I'm worried about the U.S. interest rates as we move into the second half of the year, the bond market rates. And I said, well, I understand that concern. Is it mainly driven out of inflation? She said, that's only part of the problem. Even if we do begin to bring inflation down, and even if the Fed starts to cut rates, which everyone is hoping for, crossing their fingers, praying for before the elections. Uh, she said, the borrowing demands of the U.S. Treasury are so strong in the second half of the year that this may put countervailing pressures on interest rates level in the U.S. And I went back to my office, dug up an economist in my own firm, looked at the numbers, and sure enough, uh, the chief economist of this major investment bank was right. We are living beyond our means. And there's no reason why we should be surprised if at some point the markets don't say enough is enough. Yeah, Peter. Uh, my voice loud enough that I don't need a mic. Uh, well, I, I, applaud your, I applaud your realism on uh, uh, asking the IMF to hire politics and all kind of thing for develop, uh, countries that ask loans to it. I wonder if you could be realistic about the United States. How, what would be a balanced program that you would recommend to the United States for putting its economic act to order? in order? Would you slash the Trump tax cuts of a couple years ago, or would you cut back on American Social Security payments and other forms of domestic spending? 
uh, what would be the Ameri what would your policy be for realism in the United States? I think the first thing I would do if I were given that responsibility is to create a bipartisan commission. You need bipartisan support for this. Now, it's not necessarily the case if you're in a moment of pressure. In 1987, I was also with the Treasury, as was Jack, when we woke up one day and the stock market had declined 509 points. Now today, that number doesn't seem that huge, but believe me, in 1987, it was a big number. I just arrived in, in Africa for one of my first ever visits to Africa. And as soon as I got off the plane, I was met, not by the charge at the airport, which I expected, but I was met by the ambassador, which I thought, oh, this is rather odd. The ambassador of the US to Senegal comes to meet me at the airplane, and he delivers a message for me. Call Secretary Baker immediately. I called him up. He said, Charles, come back home. I said, I just arrived in Africa. I've got two speeches to give. He said, come back home. I canceled the speeches. I went back home. The whole purpose of this is that he did build bipartisan support for the tax measures and revenue raising measures and some degree of fiscal discipline in that last year or two of the, of the Reagan administration, which set the stage eventually for George Bush's additional fiscal measures in the early 90s, which many believe cost him the election. I'm not going to get into that debate here today. But there is reason to believe that if we could get around the table sensible political leaders, and I know that seems like a stretch right now, you can find a balanced approach. I think the key here is to recognize that it has to be done over a multi-year basis. You can't drastically slash cuts in various programs, and particularly when we are increasingly in need of a strong military. You can't radically change the tax picture as much as any president may may want to, but you can certainly set in motion a 10-year plan of credibility. And is it going to involve a distribution of political pains across the spectrum of the economy? Absolutely. But you know, don't forget, as bad as our fiscal outlook is, we still have the most dynamic economy in the world. And it is capable, particularly given the potential to apply AI throughout various sectors of our economy, where we are well ahead of Europe and China, it has the potential to generate even higher degrees of productivity in the years to come. So I am not negative about the potential here of us to continue to grow, but if we put a cloud over our future, no amount of AI application will protect us from fiscal ineptitude. So I'm afraid we've reached our time, but it's great to stop on a positive note that we have a really dynamic economy. And one way to reduce the debt burden is to grow very, very quickly. And so hopefully we can do that and see a little bit of bipartisanship. I think I'm more hopeful for the growth than the bipartisanship right now, but who knows. Anyway, please join me in thanking Charles Delara.